if, if uh, the panelists want to reply to Professor Karadi. No. Perhaps one comment that um, um, it's a, uh, more or less um, a typical situation that uh, the um, scholars uh, who work uh, for the um, uh, intellectual history of uh, sciences or, or institutional history of uh, sciences uh, are interested in the, the, the prosopographically based um, uh, studies, uh, but they thought that it's uh, not their own work, uh, that is not, not, their, not their word, because they are interested in uh, one or two or three um, uh, scholars. And on the other side, that the, the um, uh, uh, empirical sociologist are uh, uh, interested in practically the the uh, the groups and the the bigger groups of uh, of uh, scholars and and interested in practically only the prosopographical or uh, sometimes Victor haven't mentioned but the bi bi bibliometrical bibliometrical uh, sources um, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, and there is very, very, uh, very, very small communication between the two type of uh, uh, scholars. So um, perhaps it would be necessary to define um, how can I say a kind of uh, uh, a kind of minimal program, a kind of minimal program that uh, the uh, and, and this minimal program would be that um, um, uh, um, the the minimal program would be the comparative study. So uh, any kind of uh, uh, intellectual history of scholars or any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, institutional history. Um, uh, should be uh, 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 comparative in some meaning, because uh, uh, in a in a comparative uh, a, a comparative study, uh, not relevant in sociological meaning or not relevant in prosopographical meaning, but it could be a kind of a basis of a kind of hypothesis that what's happened with an older or and a younger scholar, what's happened, and, and it, it kind of, it, it would be a kind of minimal project. So uh, uh, perhaps that's, that's the only thing that I uh, uh, would like to state near, near, nearby what, what Victor saw that uh, perhaps it could be a kind of minimum and uh, it, it could be a kind of, um, how can I say common aim of the of the intellectual history or science history and the sociologist of the science? Thanks. Other reply? No, from the panelists. Okay, we can open the discussion. And Thank you. Um, Victor Karari asked for um, uh, comparisons um, on the post-war purges. <clears throat> As we've heard, um, 10 out of 40 full professors at Hannover were purged after 45 and then reinstated, and I think 20 out of around 300 uh, teaching staff at Padua. Um, now, the Japanese case is actually quite interesting uh, and also uh, opens up a question to both um, presenters of these cases 
because um, the, the general image would have that um, the, the Japanese are particularly bad at um, you know, looking at their own past and, and uh, dealing with it. Uh, in fact, uh, only about 1% of higher education staff were, were purged in Japan, so a really tiny minority, but many, many more resigned voluntarily before the purge took effect. And the main reason for that is, I mean, they, they, they knew the purge criteria, so they knew you know, membership in certain associations that would, they would certainly be purged. They could retain their pension privileges when they resigned voluntarily, while those who were purged would lose the, their pension, definitely. But the net result of this was that those who resigned voluntarily never returned to their jobs. So they, they, um, re, uh, there was actually quite a generation, generational change uh, in those years, um, possibly much higher than in Italy or, or Germany, judging from those who, uh, the number of those who, who returned. So the question would be, are there at least a few cases to be found in Italy or Germany or the individual universities, Padua and Hannover, that, that people would perhaps have you know, n known that they would definitely be on the, on the blacklist and thus rather have w withdrawn voluntarily. Uh, and of course, I gave a prominent case yesterday, the, the prominent uh, ultranationalist historian at University of Tokyo, Hidaizumi Kiyoshi, who, however, who also never returned. Uh, and, but he's, of, of course, exceptional by withdrawing on the very same day that the, that the war ended. Um, another point that I think Victor already mentioned uh, concerns Anya's uh, paper. Uh, I'm really, really interested in this, in this story, also because of what happens then during the occupation in Japan, because um, the Japanese, of course, have to be convinced that co-education is a good thing. Um, they did have women's education quite substantially, women's higher education, but it was all, almost all separate in separate institutions. So co-education is really new, and um, one of the well, strategies, one of the things that convinces them that it's, it's palatable is that um, structurally it, it, it goes together. You have uh, structurally, formally co-educative co institutions, but um, women study different subjects to a, to a quite high proportion. There's home economics, things like that, and that is instituted n newly in many institutions to sort of, you know, uh, give women something that's proper for women or whatever many Japanese at that time, many male Japanese certainly would, would have thought appropriate. So I'm wondering, and this is, uh, goes along the same lines that, that Victor already uh, raised, um, you were talking about separatism and equality, and it's not a versus, I think, it sort of goes hand in hand the way I understood you. Uh, Victor said inclusion without integration, and then he also talked about protection and promotion. I think all of these point to the similar thing. I'm also interested in careers, as Victor put it, what kind of subjects did, did they choose? Was, it, was, it a, was, it a, was there a market gender pattern in, in um, majors and minors that they, that they might have um, selected, um, and that would perhaps then be similar to what 40, 50 years later I see in Japan because these are female educators that come from the US and basically persuade the Japanese to, to go this kind of path, path of a separate but equal, if you want to put it in, in those terms. Thank you. You want to reply right away? Ambassador <laughs> Jabo. Yeah. So uh, I can address that briefly. In the, in the early years that I was focusing on today, that is up until about 1925, um, interestingly, somewhat surprisingly, women and men studied basically the same subjects. Um, so women were just as well represented in the social sciences and the natural sciences as in the humanities. Um, the issue was not whether or not women had the ability to study those subjects, but whether or not they had the ability to attain academic positions in those subjects. And basically their opportunity to study those subjects far outpaced their opportunities to pursue careers in those subjects. So Marion Talbot, the Dean of Women, was a chemist, right? Um, Sophonisba Breckenridge was a political scientist, a political economist, and a legal scholar. But neither of them could get jobs in those fields. So they created new fields in which women could get jobs. And those fields were home economics for Marion Talbot and social work for Sophonis Breckenridge, which have since, which have remained, right, very uh, feminized um, occupations. But the 
But at the time that these pioneers in those fields created those occupations, they were not thinking of, the, of them as being appropriate for women, like, you know, not too difficult, right? Um, but rather just somewhere where they could get a job. Um, so the only way that, um, the only way that women academics could be, well, women academics, was by creating entirely new fields because they were not permitted to be in the old ones. So, um, oh, and then the other thing I'll just add with respect to the question about pursuing careers is, uh, in this early generation, actually about half of women who attended uh, college and university in the US uh, never married, and they did uh, pursue uh, their careers, um, although in sort of limited ways um, due to limited, limited opportunities. And, uh, and, uh, and they, did, they did then tend to, after 1925, they then, they then did tend to focus in either the humanities um, or in the new feminine fields of home economics and social work. Another question to Professor Jabo. Thank you. I have just a small question for Anya. Your uh, paper was very inspiring. Thank you very much. I'm interested in alumni community building, and I would like to know if you have some data about the behavioral patterns of women. Did they experience after uh, a, a kind of lifelong community belonging as men did in American universities? Uh, because they were pioneers in this case. So I would be interested in the annual reunion data and events, uh, fundraising and so on. Thank you. The short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> Marion Talbot actually founded the American Collegiate Association, which became the American Association of University Women. And the purpose of that organization was to provide college-educated women with a continuing opportunity to remain in contact with one another. And um, the AAUW also conducted numerous studies on vocational opportunities for women. So it was a group of highly educated women interested in promoting higher education and related uh, jobs for women. Um, the, the women's colleges very much had reunions and newsletters and um, that sort of thing. Uh, the coeducational colleges, the coeducational universities um, did not in the same way, but there were these not, not institution specific, but you know, national organizations like the American Association of University Women um, that, that fulfilled that purpose. I have another question to Professor Jabour. I have it. Um, what is the approach of, gen of American gender studies um, towards the women's history in universities? Um, um, there is um, universities are a specific field of study for. Uh, uh, women's, uh, or uh, uh, there is a collective research on this theme, because in Italy we have, for example, a different approach to gender studies, so uh, university became only a part of this approach, but not a specific approach. Yeah, I'm uh, getting the impression from this <laughs> conference that the study of education and universities as institutions is much more well-developed in Europe. Uh, much more well-developed uh, in, in Europe and, uh, and outside of, of uh, the US and, and uh, Canada and, and the UK. Um, so work in the United States and those um, Anglo-speaking uh, places uh, on education tends to, well, it tends to not be very theoretical at all. Um, and, uh, and there's not, I mean, there is a history of education journal, but it's not, it's not a, it's not a very well-developed, uh, it's not a very well-developed discipline. 
so, um, but women's historians have, from the 1960s forward, been really interested in the history of higher education because they've viewed higher education as an avenue to expanding women's horizons, and so it sort of fits in with the history of feminism. And uh, so you find it there, but historians of women's education and historians of education in the US don't really talk to each other. So we don't publish in the same journals, we don't attend the same conferences. So I think it's a very different situation. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Other questions? Remarks? Professor Moretti, please. Question for Professor Nogi. You quoted in your presentation on the same ground lexica and dictionary of national biography published under the empire, under the Horthy regime, under the communist regime, and you never mentioned the impact of this changing political context on the shaping of a national scientific tradition. And I wanted to know, there is an impact on this, because in Italy or in England, it's evident that the Dictionary of National Biography is a political enterprise, it's not the source. Okay, thank you. Uh, naturally, uh, every, th that kind of sources, every, every handbook has uh, its special uh, context. Um, and uh, that's the reason that uh, perhaps concerning the, the so-called biographical encyclopedia, I mentioned that it was published in the softer period of communism. It, uh, it was very important because uh, um, uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our generation, remember that the, the, uh, that was huge differences between the different uh, communist countries and huge differences between the different periods of communism. So perhaps that, that were a, a very... Uh, a very uh, hard period of, of uh, communist time, and uh, uh, as I know, uh, the, for example, the, the great Soviet encyclopedia, or the, uh, we, we now worked on the, of the great uh, Romanian uh, uh, encyclopedia, uh, it was a practically a, a, a total select out of the of the orders order scholars uh, in uh, as i know in poland and as i know in in hungary uh, it was not typical so uh, since the 1960s uh, 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 a kind of uh, reintegration of the of the national social uh, uh, scholars and national social uh, history um, uh, uh, started in, in some uh, uh, communist um, uh, uh, country. That was one important exception, and the exception was the, especially uh, the Hungarian uh, emigrant scholars. It was very interesting that, uh, for example, if you see the uh, um, uh, publications in the um, 70s and, and early uh, 80s that a lot of uh, uh, strictly anti-communist West European um, uh, scholars were translated uh, to Hungarian or, and, and to Polish, but not the Hungarian immigrants and not the Polish uh, immigrants. 
uh, Victor, who was a, a Hungarian immigrant in that type, in that time, remember that that, uh, for example, uh, 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 Francis Feiter, who was one of the one of the most uh, famous uh, political scientists uh, uh, about uh, about uh, East Europe, or, or Pierre Kende, who was the other, one, they they were never uh, translated to uh, to to Hungarian. Except of so-called some is that the, the secret. Uh, so that's an that's an important exception. So if we speak about the the emigration of uh, uh, 18 or emigration of 45 or emigration of 56, it's an important exception. So we don't use that kind of encyclopedias for that groups. But for other groups and for especially for history, that kind of moderate uh, period of, of communist regime or moderate period of, of 40 regime could be a kind of uh, source. Thank you. Other questions? Conclusion, yes, of course. <laughs> Yes. Oh, we have a round table, don't we? Uh, about the question of you, um, Padua was, uh, is a very case study because um, in the fascist period uh, there were a lot of differences between professors, fascists and anti-fascist professors. But 20 years later, Padua was uh, divided between the, mm, this was, uh, mm, the city of Terrorismo Nero mm, and the Terrorismo Rosso. We had uh, Ventura and Freda, we, uh, who put the bombs in Milan, and we had Tony Negri, who, we, uh, um, who was the leader of the Autonomia Operaia. So uh, it's a university with uh, very big divisions. And uh, about uh, scholarships, uh, it was very interesting uh, to find a lot of gift from uh, families, uh, from individuals and uh, um, companies uh, um, to the university. So it will be very interesting uh, a comparative a comparative study with other university um, uh, because uh, uh, I don't know if uh, this uh, um, those gift uh, were uh, uh, in the other universities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's a very uh, curious case study uh, very quickly, um, for um, Professor Karadi, Professor Karadi is completely, completely right. Uh, um, there is a, an evident uh, uh, methodological problem uh, because uh, I think it's not so easy to make a prosopography of the uh, 1968 movement. In Italy, maybe is different. Uh, in France, is is different. But uh, the movement destroyed the institutional organization uh, organizations of uh, students. So, how to make a prosopography of the students in 1968? This is a very very hard uh, question. Uh, we have to find some. Uh, uh, scientific criteria uh, to make it. Uh, but and, but uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the authorities is, is not so uneasy uh, to find uh, a, a f an efficient uh, criterion. And I don't think uh, that uh, uh, it's an aned, 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 anecdotal exercise uh, to talk about uh, uh, each uh, uh, biography or um, each uh, uh, 
public experience. I think in Italy we uh, we have a lack, uh, the, the lack of uh, an history of the ruling elites uh, of the late uh, uh, 20th uh, century. Maybe uh, this kind of uh, research uh, could help uh, in this uh, direction. Thank you. Uh, that perhaps that 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 was the the reason what I uh, mentioned before that uh, I understand that if you have no prosopography about one hundred person, but naturally you have prosopography for five person, but for but and for ten person, and the only thing what I I would suggest as a kind of minimal program, uh, a kind of uh, standardization that who are the persons who we looked. So we see all of these of universities. It's not a huge, huge I, I don't speak about that. Let's, let's look all of professors because it's a huge, huge work. But there are, uh, let's see, we look for the North Italian dean, but and, and we see every North Italian dean systematically. It's not that so big work because it's ten or fifteen or thirty person, and I think so that that would be that kind of systematization, which would be a kind of a middle way between the huge prosopographies, which. Uh, uh, preferred by, by uh, Victor Corradi, and that kind of individual stories or anecdotes which uh, uh, was, was mentioned in, in, in your lecture. So that's a kind of midway, if, it's, if you agree with me. Maybe uh, I didn't explain very well because uh, for me, for sure, uh, it's possible to make a prosopography of the deans, no problem with the, the chancellors, no problem with the, the prefects and the chief of the police. So this is, for me, it was sure. Maybe I, have, I had to, to say it uh, in an explicit way, uh, in express way. The problem is uh, uh, dealing with the students, dealing with the students' movement, because we don't have uh, any institutional representative organization of the students uh, after 1968. So no problem with deans or chancellors or uh, government authorities. Maybe I, I didn't explain well uh, this uh, part of my research. I have a question for Professor Jung. <laughs> um, you, you talk about uh, um, the internal approach uh, of uh, Hanover University to purge after the Second World War. But what was the approach of, uh, um, for example, English um, allied to university purge because Hanover is in the uh, British zone and uh, we, we know that uh, all the zone have a different approach to purge uh, on uh, mm, the different, uh, for example, uh, refers to uh, ministry or other people or uh, institutional people. What was the difference in uh, in the universities? In Italia, for example, we have two different level of approach of purge. You have a local attention and a local dimension, and uh, really different to uh, legal uh, purge um, made by uh, national laws. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, um, but um, um, I, I think uh, the, uni the technical university of Hanover, and uh, it's like the, the other universities in, in Lower Saxony, 
ähm, in Braunschweig, in Göttingen. Uh, they uh, made the same things they made f uh, before 45. Uh, they were the uh, same persons. Uh, the ten persons came back uh, in, 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 the, in the early 50s, uh, some in the late 40s, the most of it. And uh, they were all, all, all the professors were convinced they had, uh, had made the best before 45. And uh, uh, they thought uh, they made the, the same, uh, same teaching, the same research uh, after 45. Uh, and and uh, yes, uh, one of the most um, involved professor, Osenberg, I, I don't know if you know him, no. But um, he was... Um, was very uh, yeah he was involved in, in in the research in the in the third reich and uh, he uh, has uh, um, yeah he uh, uh, yeah uh, he uh, has a has a biography in the it's a catalogus professorum today and uh, there he uh, said, uh, but uh, there is said, that he uh, has, uh, his uh, big su success was uh, to bring back 5,000 scientists from the army to the science, uh, to, to research uh, for the war. And uh, this is today in this catalogus professorum, and and I uh, I think uh, it's not not a big influence from from uh, in uh, in the late 40s and the 50s from from British uh, uh, universities or so or, or other universities. Uh, they uh, they was uh, were all convinced they had to do the best and the right things. Uh, Can I add, I, if I understood your question correctly, you were asking for the attitude of the British occupation authorities towards the perch at the universities? Yes. And my understanding, I'm sorry, my understanding is that the Western allies, all three of them let the universities do their own house cleanings, the universities, while the lower schools, they would, they would, um, they would take care of that and do the, the regular, you know, um, screening and then dismissal of personnel but they respected the university's autonomy and expected them to do their own house cleanings, I believe. I'm not sure whether they were individual cases of interference when they thought that something went wrong, perhaps, and not far enough. But basically, I think that's, that was the, the shared attitude. Dr. Karadi raised an interesting question about the role of the ministry in appointment of professors during Nazism and fascism. And we can see here the persistence of old 19th century models in universities. Because in Italy, the fascist regime employed an ancient tool which existed in liberal legislation, the ministry could appoint directly and without consulting the faculty a professor. And this, is, this was largely made immediately after unification for political reasons. You had to change the staff in Papal University and so on. You need to, to appoint liberal professors. And during the second half of the 30s, and we can see here really the persistence of state-centered model against um, a different uh, organizational uh, model. In 2001 was published an important collection of essays about uh, Humboldt International, the diffusion of Humboldtian model in 19th and 20th century. But we need, I mean, also a Napoleon International, 
because the long influence of French organizational model in European and not only European history of universities has not been so deeply uh, uh, studied as the diffusion, as the spread of German model. We can see the long uh, persistence of this, of this French model in the 20th century. I mean. With, if I may just have a word, the big difference that in France, since 1895, universities were f founded uh, as collective bodies of scholars and received a level of autonomy which was not a complete autonomy. Nevertheless, for appointments, the universities basically had a complete autonomy. I mean, they would not accept imposed persons from outside. And, and they, they, they really were very, I mean, they, they looked at it, who was appointed and with what qualification, then the qualification must have been there. So they practically did have a complete autonomy in this respect. I mean, the French ones. That's an uh, interesting point you raise about the uh, obstinacy uh, persistence of the older models throughout even the fascist or national socialist periods. Even in Japan, the, uh, the, at least the imperial universities at the very top of the system, in fact, also regained their uh, personnel autonomy throughout the 1930s and 40s. However, I'm wondering, and in the German case, you could argue that the universities were almost, almost the only major institution that was not you know, gleichgeschaltet in, in, the, in the period. However, you might take the opposite view, I think, and say, well, it's the only period ever in German history that there was a federal ministry of education specifically founded that tried to also influence universities. What's that? No, it's not, okay, federal, not national. national. You're, you're absolutely right, Reichsministerium. Um, and of course, as we heard, the universities basically did what the Nazis expected from them. They expelled the Jewish professors, um, all the, the politically un undesirable ones. So there was not really perhaps such a need to, to meddle with them. And what was perhaps most importantly for the Nazi party was the students. And there, I think, Gleichschaltung was actually conducted quite heavily. Uh, autonomous student associations were dissolved and uh, Jewish ex expulsion of Jew Jews was even... Uh, conducted more radically, so I guess viewed from the Nazi leadership, everything was fine as it was, and there was really no need to, to go any further, and possibly if, if that whole experiment with a thousand year Reich would have been successful, they might have, you know, been a bit more radical, but then the war of course came and everything changed. Other questions, remarks? Oh. Andrea? As Simona said before, uh, we don't have time to make an step to conclude with, the, with an established round table, with an institutional round table. So if you also have any conclusion, final suggestions uh, or considerations regarding the whole conference uh, and what you learned uh, what you what you uh, if you if you want to highlight some results of our discussion our two days discussions well you can do it with during the last part of this informal discussion oh well i have a I'm a little bit disappointed because I prepared a, quite a roster of questions for the final round table. But I just want to, since you say that we don't have time, I'm just mentioning one very important focus for the interwar years and the post-war years, particularly for the interwar years, because there was a new start 
in European academic history after the First World War due to the creation or recreation of nation states in the eastern part of Europe. You have a number of new states emerging or new states who have new territorial uh, gains which have reshaped completely, more or less completely, the university landscapes in the center of Europe. Well, Nazification and fascization has been dealt with in the conference, but none of the other aspects of the nationalization of the student body and of the staff has been dealt with. And these problems, that is the nationalization of students, student um, clientele and staff was a central issue everywhere east of the Elbe and east of the, well, uh, well, even in Austria to some extent, of course, because there was fascization and anti-Semitic uh, backlash already in the 30s. But east of, uh, east of uh, Germany and east of Austria, you have uh, at least two big trends. One was the nationalization, at least three, sorry, three big trends. One was the establishment or re-establishment of national institutions of higher education where there had not been such uh, institutions. Like in the Baltic states, you had Russian universities and Russian uh, uh, networks of higher education which were nationalized after 1919. Now something similar happened in some parts of Central Europe like in Slovakia part of Czechoslovakia where the only tiny uh, university initiative in Presburg, Pozhoň, Bratislava was Slovakized, that is, became national. And then you have something similar in Transylvania, in Romania, where the only, uh, the only uh, university there was Romanized. So you have this network uh, of new universities or nationalized universities emerges, emerging in this part of the world. The second very important issue was the building up of national systems of higher education where there had not existed. Now, uh, the cases in point uh, are in the Balkans, uh, Serbia, uh, Croatia, uh, Bulgaria, Albania didn't have universities proper. They had initiatives, academic initiatives, faculties, but no real universities, which were built after 1919. Very important, very important issue. And of course, the third issue is a large one, which has been several times mentioned here, is the, uh, the authoritarian central uh, um, principles uh, the definition of authoritarian central principles, how to select students. That is, selective admission of students into higher education, which concerned basically in the interwar years in some countries, uh, Jews. You have numerous clauses explicitly in Hungary from immediately 1920, but you have trends of numerous clauses, that is uh, exclusion or minimization of Jewish presence in universities in Poland, in Romania, in Austria, and then of course in Nazi Germany. So uh, that kind of trends are much well, more general than those which have been dealt with with fascization and, and, and uh, Nazification. And I think that you cannot study uh, uh, the uh, university landscape in interwar um, uh, Europe without, uh, with, without recognizing the impact of these three uh, trends, especially the last one, anti-Semitism, was a heavy blow on intellectual creativity, intellectual uh, recruit, the recruitment of intellectuals in the central part of the continent. Uh, and you may find in America, sometime, to, to some extent, uh, in England too, Mannheim uh, was mentioned there, who completed his career in England. Uh, many other emigrant scholars completed their careers in America to the, fact, uh, to the effect that, for example, this is just an anecdotal but very exemplary and typical case. All but two of the 15 Nobel Prize laureates of Hungarian birth were 
uh, Jews, uh, having received their degrees, uh, their, their uh, Nobel Prizes, either in America or in Sweden or elsewhere in the West. So these are not insignificant uh, uh, effects of life for interwar uh, uh, academic sceneries in Europe. about chronology and periodization. As Robert Anderson stressed yesterday, the general political chronology is relevant but could also be misleading. Undoubtedly, uh, 45 was a watershed, but to what extent? I mean, uh, uh, the example of Japan was enlightening under this point of view, but similar opposition as we said, as we heard today, to reforms imposed by the victor in the immediate post-war period could be considered also in the Italian case, in the German case, and so on. This general political periodization is not always clear. But other general trends were clearly visible already in the 30s, I mean especially the material growth of the university system with the increasing number of students. In Italy, it's very, very clear. And the pressure for the creation of new faculties in existing university, new faculties, or for the establishment of new university. Still in the 30s, this trend is very clear. For example, I tried to reconstruct the history of Italian academic geography after unification, so the creation of new faculties and universities after 1861. And within 38 and 42 in Italy were created two small non-state universities, but the process started before the war, not after 45. This is very clear in, in the 30s. And maybe another general uh, question about practices, institutionalization, disciplinary training, closely connected with periodization, I mean. Uh, uh, the history of historiography is one of my research fields, and I would try to add a few remarks about contemporary history, the history of contemporary history as a discipline, moving from the brilliant exposition proposed by Margherita Angelini. Uh, contemporary history was practiced in the new disciplinary field defined in the first half of 19th century, in the second half of 19th century. In 1861, Johann Gustav Droysen, not last of European historian, gave lectures about the history of Deutsche Nationalversammlung in Frankfurt, 48-49. This is more than Zeitgeschichte. 30, 13 years after, he gave lectures on the history of Frankfurt Nationalversammlung. Heinrich von Treitschke, another great <laughs> nationalist historian, uh, lectured in the 60s about Italian history in the first half of 19th century when he was writing his biography of Cavour, published in uh, uh, 67, if I mean. And as Victor Caradi remembered yesterday, the in the French Academy were uh, established chair of Histoire Contemporaine in the Histoire of uh, French Revolution in the end of 19, and Histoire Contemporaine at the very beginning of the 20th century. Ah, well, I was the man in charge. The problem. In Italy, in the same year, the, uh, was proposed a new chair for history of Risorgimento, contemporary Italian history. And the proposal was rejected. The discussion about this topic is very interesting. I'm, I'm oversimplifying here. Because the reason was, in a very short way, 
A well-trained historian can deal with contemporary history, but you never became a well-trained historian if you start with contemporary history, with the sources of contemporary history, and with the problem posed by contemporary history. It was a general vision of discipline, closely connected with the historical method, that changed in the years of First World War or immediately after First World War. With the change also of the status of historical sources, in the project of uh, Monumenta Germania Historica, uh, uh, the edition of sources was limited to 1500. And for German history, it was a very good end, avoiding the Reformation and avoiding the, the great empire of Charles V. But this periodization was also adopted in Italy without a specific national reason. The Istituto Storico Italiano, created in 1883, published sources for Italian history until 1500. And only in the 20s, public editorial enterprises was promoted for the addition of sources for modern and contemporary history. So the practices came before the institutionalization, and the process of institutionalization is also closely connected with the new status of sources, but also with new political context created, in this case, by the war. But this is just one suggestion to a general debate about university disciplines. Thank you. I don't know if Professor Menazzi wants. I uh, have uh, no special uh, uh, question uh, uh, to raise uh, because, as you know, I am not uh, a specialist uh, about uh, the history of uh, uh, university. Um, perhaps. Uh, uh, I can uh, uh, only uh, say uh, two or uh, three uh, things uh, about uh, the colleagues who cannot uh, uh, be uh, with us. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a round table uh, with uh, uh, other professors, uh, but uh, uh, these professors uh, are uh, not uh, come here. Professor Graziosi, uh, whose uh, adhesion uh, was uh, from the beginning uh, hypothetical, has uh, informed us uh, that uh, his uh, engagements uh, um, uh, took place uh, uh, in uh, uh, coincidence uh, with uh, our colloquium. Uh, Professor Prodi, after a long hospitalization, uh, has not yet uh, recovered his uh, full uh, health and uh, Professor Signosi, Signori, whose uh, son, a photo reporter uh, um, who has been killed uh, in uh, Ukraine, in uh, Ukraine, has informed uh, us uh, thus uh, in uh, this year a remembrance uh, ceremony uh, will uh, take place uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, and so she cannot uh, be uh, with, uh, with us. So, I, uh, I, I, I can uh, uh, say uh, that uh, uh, these uh, colleagues uh, have uh, sent us uh, their uh, regards, their wishes for uh, a good uh, works, and uh, I think that our work has been really a good work. Many questions uh, have been raised, and uh, uh, these questions uh, can uh, help uh, a path uh, of uh, research uh, that uh, will, uh, will uh, continue in the next uh, years, also with uh, your help. So thank you very much for your interventions, for uh, your very skilled uh, presence uh, in uh, our uh, debates, 
and uh, the best uh, wishes for uh, the works of, all, uh, of us. As a conclusion, Professor <laughs> Pedro Martin uh, will hand out uh, a no after a cartoon that show a, a student washing up. <laughs> it encourages us to reflect uh, on the present situation of <laughs> students, scholars in uh, Spain and Italy. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>